Yeah, so uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to our uh, weekly Wednesday seminar. And today we have Professor Raj Gandhi from HRI, and I invite uh, Professor Mashankar from Physics Department to inv uh, introduce Professor Gandhi. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shammo. Uh, <coughs> Professor Raj Gandhi is uh, well known in uh, particle physics community in India. And in particular, uh, within the neutrino physics community, he is one of the leaders. Uh, he started out in life as an engineer from uh, MS University, Baroda, but uh, the pull of physics was too strong. And uh, he did a PhD in particle physics from University of Wisconsin at Madison, and then uh, was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, NICEF in uh, Netherlands, uh, University of Arizona, and uh, later at uh, Texas A&M, uh, where I guess you watch a lot of football. And uh, then he returned to India and uh, joined HRI in 1995. And since then, he has been one of the pioneers of uh, neutrino research in India. And uh, we have had a fairly long collaboration starting around 2003 for about 10 years, where we have uh, collaborated on different aspects of uh, atmospheric neutrinos. And of uh, course, and in the early days of INO, he was one of the members of the program committee and uh, steered INO during its early days. And uh, even though we have not written a paper together now in the last uh, seven or eight years, but uh, we regularly talk to each other on various problems related to neutrinos in particular and particle physics in general. And with this introdu introduction, I request Professor Raj Gandhi to start his talk. Thank you, Uma. Uh, it has always been a pleasure to interact with you, uh, uh, both physics-wise and as, as a friend. Um, so today, I uh, want to talk about some uh, very recent work that we have done. Um, and uh, it relates to trying to understand the long-standing LSND and mini boon anomalies uh, using new physics. Uh, so let me begin by um, saying that uh, uh, so uh, just before that, Shomyo, should I turn off the video or I am okay or? Uh, let's keep it on as long as it lasts and then maybe later okay, we can. Okay. Yeah, all right. So, uh, you know, over the last several decades, the standard model has provided us with a very strong framework for uh, basically decide, making decisions about what experiments to um, start next and what calculations to do, what checks to do. Um, in, in effect, it has turned out to be a very reliable predictor of uh, um, physics, which was uh, being checked once we discovered the major components of the model. Uh, now, however, uh, the agreement, the consistent agreement of experimental data, uh, in particular when we have done some very important and, um, uh, you know, wide-ranging collider physics uh, experiments, it carries with it a little bit of uh, frustration also because you would like to see signals which are anomalous. You would like to see um, uh, hints from uh, experiments as to where the next uh, step in uh, extending the standard model is. 
uh, that somehow has not happened, although uh, collider physics has provided some very crucial, very um, important and complex uh, cross checks of uh, all the predictions of the model, uh, which is of course uh, extremely important. Um, uh, but our hope that there would be new physics has not really um, uh, fructified um, as far as colliders go. The only hint for physics beyond the standard model so far is um, neutrino masses and that has come from low energy uh, 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 neutrino experiments. Uh, now over the past decade or so there have been other hints uh, from uh, low energy experiments and um, I will be my talk will be based on uh, some of the more important uh, hints of this nature. Uh, so what are some of these low energy hints or anomalies? Um, um, these are basically all uh, almost all of them are non collider related um, anomalies. Uh, so first of all, we have seen excesses in electron um, events in short baseline neutrino experiments. And um, I will say more about this in a little while. Um, and um, they have led to a certain interpretation in terms of the existence of a sterile neutrino, one or more sterile neutrinos, which have masses in the EV range. Um, Another important discrepancy, which is long-standing and has statistical significance, is uh, the value of the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. And more recently, there is some discrepancy in the value for the electron also. Uh, there's a third more recent discrepancy, which is interesting, but uh, not as not on as firm a basis as the muon uh, discrepancy and the excess electron events uh, as the first two in this on this slide. Uh, but in the Koto experiment, um, it looks for k on decay to pions and a pair of neutrinos. And they see many more events. Um, uh, I mean, they, they expect something like 0.1 event and they see four. Um, but again, um, the statistics are yet to be um, you know, strengthened because this is, uh, um, these are difficult experiments. And um, so we don't have enough statistics to come to any real conclusion. Uh, then there are discrepancies in uh, B-related decays. Um, um, and um, finally, there is uh, an anomaly in the decay of excited states of beryllium, uh, which again points to some kind of low energy uh, pair production effect, um, E plus, E minus, or a, a photon, or a pseudo scalar boson, and so on. Okay, so uh, my focus is going to be. Um, uh, two experiments, um, uh, LSND and Miniboon. And now these are long standing anomalies with high statistical significance, which I will, um, as you will see on the next uh, slide. Um, and um, they have uh, been interpreted over um, the past decade or so as uh, hinting towards the existence of a sterile neutrino. Um, now, when you do that, um, as um, you test that hypothesis, um, people have done short baseline Nui disappearance experiments, um, where you have gallium and sage um, detectors being calibrated um, and Nui disappearance has been measured there. Um, and uh, also Nui appearance, which is the essence of LSND and Miniboon anomalies has been tested in a number of uh, detectors. And finally, Nui mu disappearance has been tested. 
So over the years, we have built up a picture on this sterile neutrino hypothesis. And right now, what the picture is telling us is that there is a strong tension between disappearance data and appearance data. If you want to interpret the excess in electrons that is seen in experiments like LSND and Miniboom, uh, in terms of a sterile neutrino. Um, now, let me add that there are, there are other experiments on this list, like a new disappearance I list, atmospheric neutrino, solar, etc. So these have simply helped us um, uh, pin down the mass square differences of the ordinary neutrinos. But in the experiments in orange, LSND, mini boon, gallium, you have real anomalies, which you cannot understand. And the first um, um, uh, natural solution was sterile neutrinos. Um, but as I said, there's tension in that also um, right now. So I will be focusing on uh, LSND and mini boon. So LSND uh, was an experiment that I think began in 1993 and went on till 1997 or eight. Um, and uh, it had 800 MeV protons on target and um, was um, um, looking at neutrino beams, uh, which were um, coming from a muon decay at rest. So for instance, uh, here you would get a new mu bar. Um, and it also had a flux uh, coming from um, a pion decay in flight, uh, which would then give you a new mu beam. So it had two kinds of fluxes. Uh, and uh, what it saw was an excess of electron-like events. So here's, here's the data, as you can see in this, uh, in this figure. And um, um, these are backgrounds, the green and the red are backgrounds. So you can see there's a well-defined and a strong excess uh, that is being seen. Um, the blue shaded region is uh, trying to fit it with one sterile neutrino oscillating um, uh, with some uh, uh, mixing with some um, standard neutrinos. So how did LSND, what exactly did LSND see? Uh, so LSND had a muon antineutrino beam, if you were looking at decay at rest. It came in and um, it gave you, it, it, uh, the, uh, the nucleus was CH2, um, and it gives you, uh, knocks out a neutron. And um, um, what they saw was uh, that they had an excess of electron type events. Um, so, so they assumed that, that the new mu bar has oscillated to new E uh, while coming to the detector. And uh, in standard neutrinos at this length of 30 meters, which LSND had, uh, you, you do not expect uh, that kind of oscillation given what we know from other standard oscillation data. Uh, so you, from the electron, you will see a Cherenkov cone um, in, the, in the PMTs that are uh, in the detector. And uh, you will also see scintillation light coming from the electron. And finally, when you knock out the neutron, it gets recaptured, then uh, it emits a 2.2 MeV photon. So LSND then correlated this photon along with the Cherenkov cone of this, and that was their event. Um, and they saw, which you can see here, they are basically, this is the inverse beta decay interaction. And uh, they, decay, uh, they detected uh, 3.8 sigma excess uh, of events. Okay, so these are LSND fluxes. Um, there's decay at rest, as I said, and decay, pion decay in flight. Um, LSND 
um, the sterile neutrino explanation uses only the decay at rest flux, uh, which is much larger than the decay in flight flux. For us uh, in the scenario that I will present, um, uh, the decay in flight flux is important. So I will, I will come back to this slide again uh, later. Um, Okay, so then uh, when uh, there was this anomalous result, this excess in LSND, um, and it was felt that this could be sterile neutrinos, um, um, the mini Boone experiment was planned to test LSND. Uh, so if you're looking for oscillations uh, of a particular kind, you try to keep the L over the, uh, the same, uh, and that is what Mini Boon did, except that it went for a higher energy beam at 500 MeV average energy. Uh, so it had its detector at 500 meters, um, but kept the same L over E, which is um, uh, one meter per MeV. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a similar detector, which again has carbon and uh, scintillation light as uh, detection. Um, and um, uh, uses uh, protons on target, uh, which give you pions, which give you um, muons and uh, neutrinos. So here you have decay in flight of pions giving you the neutrino beam. So please, please stop me if I'm uh, going too fast or, or if there's any question. Uh, Raj, uh, yeah. I'm a little unfamiliar. So why is something at rest? Uh, it's a beam dump kind of experiment. No? So what is the decay at rest? So uh, the decay at rest uh, actually um, uh, brings the muon to a stop. Oh, that's so actually put something to uh, uh, slow it down. That's right. Yeah, okay. let me... Uh, so, so you see these rocks um, okay. here, and um, you can see the muon stopping in the rock. If I, I I'm not sure you can see the arrow that I have on my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So you can see the muon stopping in the rock, and um, uh, uh, so this brings the muon to a stop. This is what LSND does. Okay. Um, brings the muon to a stop and then looks at decay at rest. So the spectrum is well defined and well understood because it's coming from this um, at rest muon. That is not what is happening in mini boon. Okay. In mini boon, this is the pion decay in flight. In flight, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, so the spectrum, as you can see, is more wide band, mm -hmm. as you can see here. You know, because it's decaying in flight and um, uh, unlike the muon. Yeah. And as I mentioned in LSND also there's decay in flight, which becomes important for the scenario I will talk about. But, but these are the two modes of... Um, of uh, uh, there there also is decay in flight of pions, right? Yes, there also there was decay in flight of pions. And uh, here it is only decay in flight of pions. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, when you come to mini boon, it's important to understand, uh, see if you see an excess and it looks like an electron, the point is it may not be exactly an electron. And uh, let me explain that. Um, so how do you discriminate this various, um, things that you will see in a detector like mini boon. Much of this applies to LSND also because that also had mineral oil as its medium um, and uh, photo tubes to collect the light, uh, like mini boon. Okay, so if you have a muon, you have a very clean ring. It does not Bremsstrahlen. So this ring looks very nice. If you have an electron, there's much more a Bram Strahlung and uh, photons production and so on thing become somewhat diffuse. If you have two photons, then again, you have this kind of, so here's two photons. Here's a pi zero that's decaying into two photons. So 
For a while in the detector, you have a displaced vertex where you don't see anything. And then you see an electron-like object, but this could very well be two, uh, uh, a pair uh, E plus E minus. So each of these photons is giving you some kind of pair type of signal and they look like electrons, okay? So that point is uh, somewhat relevant for uh, trying to understand what the origin of the excess might be. Okay, so Mini Boon looked for um, uh, this kind of, had this new mu beam, and um, they were hoping to test the oscillation physics hypothesis of a sterile neutrino, which would then uh, give you roughly the same parameters as LSND did. Uh, that uh, somehow did not completely happen. LSND found another puzzle. It found an excess at lower energies than they were thinking. And at lower energies, the excess is very significant and not something that you expected. It can still be fit with oscillation. So let me, let me uh, be very uh, clear about that. And I will show you that I'm, I'm, in a minute, I'll show you that fit. Uh, it can still be fit with oscillations, but uh, it's uh, not a very good fit. Um, and uh, the parameters that you have for mini boon, the best fit parameters are not quite the parameters that you get from LSND and so on. This is apart from the fact that the sterile neutrino hypothesis is disfavored from muon disappearance data, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Okay, so here's the, here's the, to come back to what I was saying, here's the mini boon results. There are excesses. Um, this, this shows the energy distribution of the reconstructed energy of the neutrino. And in lower energy beams, you have very significant excesses. And now here I have plotted um, uh, the, the same upper data is plotted in this lower in a different uh, variable. The variable here on the x-axis is visible energy or the light that you collect. And you can see the excess again. Now the dashed lines, the dashed lines here are what oscillation fits are. So these fits are not great, but they are acceptable, okay? If you then uh, try to think of this as sterile oscillations, you have some, some um, reason to, to believe that. Uh, importantly, there is an angular distribution that is measured. And there is an excess in each angular bin, as you can see, above background, okay? So, uh, and, and here again is the dash line is the relation um, uh, fit. And you can see that in the important bins where there are large numbers of events, there are discrepancies. Um, so uh, an important point is if you are trying to explain mini boon with new physics or LSND with new physics, uh, more importantly, if you're trying what we uh, have tried um, is to explain both with the same new physics and the same benchmark parameters. Uh, you have to fit the energy distribution in mini boon, the angular distribution in mini boon, the energy distribution in LSND and the angular distribution in LSND. You have to fit all four of them and that's a very tight um, constraint. It's a stringent constraint. Um, so any new physics, if it is to be properly tested or be credible, has to satisfy that. Okay, now you can wonder that is this background, this excess and so on, because you see the backgrounds are large. For instance, here's this reddish brownish uh, thing is the background from pi on mass identification. So pion misidentification means that the pion decays two photons, but one of them is missed and uh, you see only one photon and then that looks like an electron. So you could have missed it and so on. So these are the important backgrounds. Now, 
the good thing is that given the time that mini boon has been running it's been running for 17 years uh, it has done all kinds of tests and background measurements which make the result credible and reliable unlike many other low energy uh, anomalies which are more recent and are yet to be formally tested um, only lsnd the muon g minus 2 and mini boon have withstood the test of time and those are the three anomalies that i we will focus on okay so they have measured all these backgrounds in situ uh, without um, relying on theory or calculations they have made measurements of this so that makes uh, their result uh, firmer and more credible because uh, the backgrounds have been measured by them they are not not theory uh, Uh, predictions only okay to come back to the possible explanation um of uh, mini boon and lsnd in sterile neutrino you can hypothesize that there is one sterile state uh, which is ev um, uh, some ev few ev in mass and um, then you can try to fit it with oscillations um and um, nui appearance is being measured by one set of experiments nui disappearance by another set and new mu disappearance by a third set and all of those can be tested um in in this uh, scenario uh so that is what um is being um uh, uh, these these um, two flavor oscillation formula is given here um, and these are the things that are in terms uh, i mean the terms that are important i'll come to those in a minute um, but the essential point is that as we have gathered um, more data what we find that the set of appearance experiment which governs this product or is governed by this product in the oscillation formula two flavor oscillation formula um that appearance is in strong conflict with disappearance data see this is all excluded by disappearance another set of experiments and this is what is allowed by appearance so there is a 4.7 sigma tension if you try to um fit this um this excuse me yes if you try to fit this with a sterile neutrino uh raj uh, one question yeah. uh, the disappearance uh, data that you have plotted uh, that is um, more due to new mu to new mu disappearance or new e to new e disappearance new mu to new mu disappearance okay yeah the the reactor um and uh, gallium data is is relatively not as strong or the constraint is um very diffuse it spread out in small regions all over the space but uh, the ice cube minus minus plus and uh, di um diabe constraints which um give you new mu to new mu disappearance are very strong and that that is what essentially is is uh, no but uh, diabe would be new e to new e ah uh, sorry uh, not diabe minus minus plus i uh, 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 and presumably t to k and nova also yes they also add to these constraints yeah. okay. because they all can measure new mu disappearance right okay so this is this is basically the global fit a large part of it is coming from um, minus minus plus and I, a large part of the strength comes from minus cube i believe okay so let me summarize the salient points the tension between appearance and disappearance is very significant so that casts a uh, uh, shadow on um, attempts to um, you know uh, explain this with sterile neutrinos if you remove any experiment then the sterile neutrino fit does not uh, improve 
or if you add more sterile in neutrinos then again there is no significant improvement in the fit or in the reduction or significant reduction in tension also standard cosmology does not favor the existence of one or more sterile neutrinos in this mass range uh, and uh, you would have to make uh, important modifications to accommodate a sterile neutrino in the ev square range if it is found finally there is really no theoretical motivation we have for an ev scale sterile neutrino so uh, given all this um, it makes sense to look for other new physics um, which is what we have tried to do here so when you try to look for new physics um, then um, um, there are certain things you have to keep in mind before you come up with a hypothesis. Um, uh, because you're at low energies, there are lots of constraints, lots of experiments uh, that um, uh, have uh, restricted um, uh, the hypotheses that can be built. Okay, so I'm going to go through a few of those. I mean, there's a detailed discussion of constraints in our paper, but I'm just going to go through a few of the important um, um, constraints. See, Mini Boon did a beam dump run. In, an, in the beam dump run, what they do is that they remove the beryllium target that they had, uh, but let the protons hit the steel, uh, a steel beam dump. What does that do? Uh, see that there were, there were many models or hypotheses in trying to explain this uh, mini bone excess, which said that, um, uh, you know, um, you have a dark matter particle that is scattering here. It's produced in the beam somewhere and it comes and scatters in the detector and gives you um, an uh, excess. Um, uh, which looks like uh, electron or produces an electron like signal. So when you do the beam dump, uh, you will still get a production of these dark matter particles. The main mode of production is that you produce, um, of course you produce all kinds of pions, but you produce this pi zero, uh, which gives you two photons, the photons is mixed with a new dark photon that then gives you a pair of dark matter particles. And this comes here. So, so if you remove the target, what do you do? When you remove the target, essentially you suppress neutrino production because the pi plus pi minus, which give you neutrinos, are absorbed in the beam um, in this in any thick target. Okay. So you are then not allowing the new, you are suppressing the neutrino flux a lot, but you are allowing the pi zero flux. Now, since the dark matter production is linked to the dark photon pair producing uh, dark matter particle, that should continue unabated and you should still see an excess. Well, what happens is that you don't see an excess. If you cut down or remove the neutrino flux, the excess disappears. That was a very important uh, test that they did. Um, and if you have something that scales simply as the protons on target, which is what happens when you have this beam dump test with the target removed, uh, you would expect 35 events in excess, you only see six. Out of those, there was an expected background of eight or nine events. So obviously there is no excess uh, when you cut down, the, um, um, when you do this beam dump test. So this told us that whatever is happening is due, is, has its origin in the neutrino. Then there are certain things that we need to understand um, how these detectors detect electrons. See, in Mini Boon, if you have a photon or a closely spaced E plus E minus pair, if it has an angle of five degrees or less, or its total energy is 30 MeV, Mini Boon will not be able to distinguish it from 
um, a photon or an electron. It just sees what it will, it will call it as an electron-like signal. So that's an important thing. If you're producing pairs which are, um, uh, you know, have less total energy, come, I mean, are below 30 MeV, to mini bone, it looks like an electron. In LS and D, the same thing is true, but the, this angle restriction that you have in mini boon is, is uh, removed. LS and D never looked for pairs or was not built to detect any kind of pair signal. So every time a pair is produced, LS and D will take the most energetic lepton and fit it and say it is an electron. So the angle between the pair can be large in LS and D and you would still see it as an electron. So these points are important for new physics solutions um, when you're trying to make a new physics solution. Now there are certain general constraints and guideposts uh, which will apply to any new physics solution. And um, uh, it is good to review the, that um, um, here before I um, present our solution. Um, so typically you will have some new interaction by some new mediator and it involves dark fermions or scalars. Um, and uh, the new interaction will produce an electron-like signal in the final state. What do you have to do then? You have to check that neutrino electron scattering bounds. See, because you have an electron-like signal um, in a um, uh, scattering of a nucleus. You have to check that neutrino electron scattering bounds from high energy experiments are not violated. And there are stringent bounds from CHAM and MINERVA because if you produce pairs, they will look like electrons and they will add to the observed signal. Uh, so you have to worry about that. Neutrino nucleon scattering bounds at high energies are not violated. Okay, you don't want to uh, disturb what you see at um, um, say high energy detectors like ice cube uh, because you have now added a new mediator and a new interaction which will add to the um, say the neutral current cross section or the charge current cross section. Secondly, there are many experiments um, at low energies, um, mostly near detectors of various um, long baseline experiments, which look for pairs because pairs are important background, say, um, um, uh, when you are measuring the photon background, you are looking for pairs and so on. So if you are producing pairs via new interaction, you have to worry that you do not violate any constraints from there. Um, secondly, um, the mediator here has to interact with quarks because you are interacting that the target is CH2. So the, whatever your new mediator is, it should not violate FCNC bounds uh, because there'll be co new quark interactions uh, that are added. Okay, so... Um, and uh, now coming to uh, the model that um, we have proposed. Um, um, uh, before I do that, let me say that uh, gradually it is um, understood that explaining mini boon and LSND is very important because the combined significance of this anomaly is uh, right now something like six point two sigma if I remember correctly. And it has not gone away. It's been there for a long time. People have looked at it, checked it. Uh, backgrounds have been measured. The various checks have been done. Uh, so it's important uh, that we perhaps try to find a solution that works uh, for both of them. Um, okay. Uh, the model that we propose is uh, simple. You just add a second Higgs doublet to the standard model. There's already a very well studied extension of the standard model. And then we add a, a light dark scalar 
uh, to this because you will need access to the dark sector, um, a, a portal to the dark sector. Um, uh, so these things were already clear uh, from uh, um, other attempts. There have been many attempts to understand mini bone, to understand LSND. Um, no one, uh, no single attempt has um, succeeded completely so far. Um, but from their work, it is clear that you need some dark particles interacting with the standard model. Um, so we extend the standard model with uh, Higgs and um, another light uh, dark particle. Um, and um, essentially, these are, this is a well-studied um, scenario. Um, and we add three right-handed neutrinos because you need to give the neutrinos mass. Uh, now it turns out that two of these right-handed neutrinos participate in the interaction as, as we will see in mini bone and LSND. So that gives a nice uh, economy uh, to the model. Uh, and uh, the, I'll mention this, that the benchmark parameters that uh, solve LSND and mini bone uh, also give you mass square differences via the type one C so in the correct range uh, that its global neutrino data, uh, delta m square three one and two one. Okay, so this is the interaction diagram um, for what is happening vis-a-vis -vis new physics in mini bone and LSND. So we needed something that starts with the neutrinos because the mini bone beam dump experiment showed that uh, um, it is the neutrinos that are uh, somehow responsible for the excess. So you have this muon neutrino coming in from the beam and here it upscatters to a heavy dark neutrino. This new interaction is mediated by um, the scalar mediators. Uh, so now you have three scalar mediators, uh, three um, uh, mediators coming from uh, the dark sector, one from the dark sector, and then you have this um, CP even scalar that will be added when you add a second Higgs doublet. Um, so um, this way you are talking both to the dark sector and uh, the extended standard model. Um, and um, these mediators are uh, linked by Yukawa couplings to quarks. Um, as this heavy neutrino is produced, it decays promptly to um, a light scalar, the light scalar that we added. Um, um, and that decays promptly to an E plus E minus pair. All, all of these couplings come out of the model. I have given these uh, benchmark parameters here. Let me point out some important. Um, so these, these um, heavy neutrinos, which actually give the neutrinos, uh, standard neutrinos mass, have uh, masses of 85 MeV, 130 MeV, and 10 GeV. And then these two new scalars, all of these are being fixed by the effort to fit both LSND and mini boots simultaneously. So there's a light scalar, which is 15 MeV, and there's a heavier scalar, which is 750 MeV. Both of them are acting here as mediators in this interaction. And the lighter one is playing a another role where it gives you the E plus E minus after being radiated from here. Okay, so this uh, other heavy neutrino, which is actually the lightest of the three, escapes the detector or it decays into invisible particles, um, maybe standard neutrinos. Um, uh, but it's um, um, these couplings of H and H prime to U and D quarks are dominant in the model compared to other quarks. The other quark couplings are basically free. You can just uh, keep them very weak. Uh, that also helps with FCNC constraints. Uh, so essentially the heavy neutrinos participate in the interaction as well as help in generating masses for the standard neutrinos. And this fixes all the benchmark parameters. 
Um, so ha taking this process that also I showed on the previous page, you calculate the total cross section for CH2. In mini boon, that cross section has both incoherent and coherent parts. Uh, in LSND, only the incoherent part is important because you produce a neutron in the final state, which is not the case in mini boon. So for LSND, we add only the incoherent part. For mini boon, both parts are important. Um, and the coherent part is controlled by, um, as we know that the coherent contribution is larger when Q square is closer to zero. Uh, so we have a standard factor that uh, brings down the contribution as um, uh, this momentum transfer increases. Um, or, or, um, um, and, and as it goes closer and closer to zero, you get more coherence. Um, anyway, so then, then you have uh, this event rate um, formula and um, you can see there's the branching ratio of N2 to N1 will appear here um, because there are other couplings um, and other decay modes. So we have to take the branching ratio um, that appears in this model. Um, and then of course, there are all this detector related information. We put all that in and uh, you get results. <clears throat> so this is the mini boon excess. And uh, there's a solid blue line, which is our result. And the blue band is um, the error bar for systematics uh, for neutrino energy distribution and uh, neutrino angular distribution. So you see, difficulties that certain models have in filling, making the interaction forward. Like here's the oscillation result. And there's a big gap between the data and this because it's difficult to get the angular distribution right. Um, um, and I'll, I'll come to reasons for that. Uh, but uh, we fit the angular and energy distribution for both detectors. Here is LSND and um, the excess events, uh, we get something like 34 events, if I'm not mistaken, and they have 32. Um, so both angular and energy for both detectors are fit. Um, Raj? Very well, uh, yes. The the right-handed the heavy neutrino masses that you displayed yes uh, the three of them how do you uh, I mean what is the source for them or how do you determine them yeah so I'll uh, that's a you're, you're uh, very important question yeah I'll I'll come to that in okay. a minute or two yeah I mean so you have uh, I mean those masses are important to uh, get this fit right. That's correct. Yeah, I see. And they are crucial to as them. well as the Yukawas uh, of that hidden uh, Higgs and all that. That is correct. All yes. of those are so some five seven parameters. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, um, I, I I think I I'll come to the answer to Jit's question maybe in a slide or two. Um, but um, let me point out certain relevant things. See, in LSND, our scenario, all the events come from the high energy part of the diff flux. The diff flux was not something that um, LSND uh, focused on uh, f with good reason, of course, um, uh, in understanding the sterile neutrino, uh, understanding the excess as part of a sterile neutrino. Um, we have to use the diff flux um, um, because, um, okay. See, we produce an N2 here, and that N2 has a mass of 130 MeV. Okay, so. you need the additional energy. The diff flux is at a higher energy. So you have this muon neutrino flux. We tap into only this part 
of the diff flux to get because you have to produce something some object which is 130 mv okay uh, so that uh, that uses only this part of the flux uh, if you were to use the decay at rest which is what is used for the neutrino oscillation hypothesis your energies are very low the available energy so you cannot produce anything heavy in the detector but you can because you have the decay in flight flux giving you higher energy neutrinos um, okay so all of our events come from the decay in flight flux uh, then i want to point out that both h and h prime are mediators the contribution of this H prime, which is the lighter mediator and is 15 MeV in mass is smaller, but it's important because what happens is that it gives a big coherent contribution that helps correctly populate the forward angular bin in mini bone. See in the, in the oscillations scenario and in other scenarios, you cannot populate this bin easily, but with us, H prime giving you enough, the contribution of the H prime, although it's like 10%, it mostly forward. Uh, so it fills this bin properly and the other bins then are, uh, uh, are filled by mainly contributions from the heavier Higgs. So both mediators become important. Okay, finally, uh, for those of you who may remember, there was an experiment called Carmen. Um, which tried to test LS and D. It was sort of contemporaneously done at that time. It could not see any excess. Now, in our scenario, it would not see any excess because it just, this blue region is the common flux. This is the flux and this is the energy. This is the de decay in flight flux of LS and D. Okay, so this is much smaller and it would not be able to produce the heavy neutrinos. And so it would see nothing, uh, which is what um, it reported. Although LSND was seeing an excess. Okay. Um, so um, uh, let me discuss a couple of points um, uh, that we have to worry about. See LSND, let me go back. So LSND data was collected up to 60 MeV and this is where they saw an excess. What happens after that? Because they do have a DIF flux, which we are using um, to get our events. So what happens after that? Um, see, they saw six events with a correlated neutron. Uh, in the energy range between 60 MeV and 200 MeV. So it's important for us to calculate that in our model because we don't want to exceed or, um, or get too many events beyond 60 MeV. And the calculations give you only 5.6 events. So you are compatible with what they saw. Uh, because if you see too many events with neutrons beyond 60 MeV, again, you have a problem the cross section drops accordingly to give you few events. Um, then, um, okay, you have to make an assumption, how much energy do you need to knock out a neutron from a carbon nucleus? We have assumed eight MeV, uh, which is a standard assumption. Um, now, um, the masses of these neutrinos, N2, N1 are important because you need to balance both of these apparently not so compatible experiments at different energies. Uh, you need to uh, balance this to get the correct number and correct distributions for both angle and energy in both experiments. If I lower the mass of N2, okay, then what happens is that I increase the total um, events um, significantly because then I will tap into more and more um, regions of um, this uh, DIF flux. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we may have around another five minutes or so. Okay, I'll try to hurry up. Um, so if I lower the mass of the heavy neutrino to be produced, then I will tap into lower energies and still get an excess. 
um, but then the flux increases. So you get a lot more events than what LSNB saw. Okay. Uh, then if I decrease the mass of N1, then um, the event peak shifts towards higher visible energies leads to uh, more correlated neutron events than uh, six. Uh, so again, that would be a conflict with what LSNB saw. So these masses tightly control the data in LSND or the results in LSND. And at the same time, they are giving you neutrino masses. They play a role in uh, the seesaw mechanism. Okay, the mu one G minus um, two uh, can be nicely accommodated in this model. I will not spend too much time on it, but these new scalars make a contribution where this lepton is the mu one and so on. And uh, you calculate that contribution and this is this delta AM U is what you need. And the only parameter that you need to fix is the Yukawa coupling to the muon, which we do, it is not constrained um, and uh, gives you uh, the correct value of um, one loop correct value of this um, muon G minus two. Okay, you know, I need to worry about charm and Minerva constraints, as I said. Um, Again, going a bit quickly, there have been a lot of attempts. Many of them use a new scalar, a new uh, U1 gauge boson or a dark photon. Okay, when you do that, typically you produce too many events in high energy new E scattering in charm and Minerva. And uh, you, this is, uh, this is a, one of the papers that has a new dark Z uh, and um, uh, that uh, violates, um, apparently violates this constraint from uh, um, uh, new E data. However, when you have scalar mediators, what uh, one finds is that the cross section drops with energy. See, this is at 20 or 25 MeV, uh, GeV. So as you go up in energy, the cross section drops sufficiently and there is no um, issue or you are well below uh, order of magnitude below any kind of conflict with new e scattering data. So it's the behavior of the cross section of a scalar mediator vis-a-vis -vis, um, U1 mediator that leads you to the choice of scalars. There's also an important constraint coming from the near detector of uh, T2K um, because that sees pairs. Um, going over this quickly, you would expect in a new scenario like ours, 20 events at one sigma, 34 at two sigma, 49, or if it is a one shower event, which is actually unresolved, E plus E minus, then again, 58, 181, 300. Uh, similarly, single E shower. Um, and uh, we calculate the events our model gives in this and we find only nine events. So you are very comfortably um, uh, evading this constraint, which is an important constraint for many models. There's another constraint at high energy that I mentioned, a neutral current, new nucleon scattering. In ice cube, you will, um, this neutrino will scatter to N2 in our model. And uh, then that might decay and give you a pair and you will see double banks and so on. So now this distance has to be calculated at ice cube energies. And we find that we are fine. It would actually decay very quickly and so be subsumed in the first shower itself. So there would be no double bank event. Uh, these are again important constraints that we had to worry about. Okay, there are K on and B meson decay constraints. Let me skip that, but these are uh, basically something that we have explained in detail in the paper and, uh, and um, uh, there is no, no um, uh, violation of any constraint of these decay and electron uh, beam dump experiments also in our scenario. So um, coming to the conclusion, uh, see, you have now enough evidence for low energy um, discrepancies. Um, 
LSND and Mini Boon are special. They have been around a long time. They are now statistically very solid, and it is important to find an answer or understand their origin. When you do that, you can make you have to make certain assumptions. Okay, you can assume that this is background. Then uh, you set up experiments to measure the standard model background, or you can assume this sterile neutrino. Then you have to set up a set of experiments as is already been done. to measure the discover the sterile neutrino so likewise we have to make an assumption that there is a common non oscillation new physics explanation for this which we make then there is also an underlying belief that when you find such an explanation you will also find a long sort extension to the standard model and also some connection to the dark sector as well as a, a good solution should shed light on other things like um, uh, our extension is 2 higgs doublet model uh, then the dark sector is um, can it connects to the dark sector via a light singlet scalar and there are heavy dark neutrinos um, but it also um at the same time generates uh, neutrino masses it explains uh, g minus 2 um and um basically um helps you understand certain things that were earlier not um, or at least accommodate certain things um so uh, the predictions are that there's two new light scalars uh, which are um, the, addition um to the model and um let me point out that this h prime which is 15 mev um the t2k near detector sees an excess in um a 10 to 20 invariant mass spin uh when they look when they measure try to measure the photon background for uh, electron um, scattering uh so let me show you that um so this bin here while the other bins fit quite well both in neutrinos and anti neutrinos you see an excess in the 10 to 20 mev bin uh this uh, they are looking for photons which are giving pairs and they see an excess so in our case it would be um h prime of 15 mev giving pairs Uh, so we have discussed this with the collaboration, and they are currently reanalyzing the data in this bin to see if this excess is something that uh, could be interesting. Uh, okay, I think I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. I, I do have several questions. So, Somyo, maybe you can yeah. hand over to us and leave or. Uh, Yeah. So, I mean, there's no urgent talk. question. Then maybe we can end the session right, here. Right. No, I think mine are a little more technical and uh, detailed. So right. Um, so yeah, I don't see any any hand raised or anything. So let me thank Professor Gandhi again for this nice talk, and uh, let me end the session. But please stay here. Maybe we can have an elaborated discussion. We'll just have a chat. Okay. Thanks, Om. Okay. Thank you, Shammo. Uh, uh, actually, Urjit, can I ask one quick question? Sure, sure. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, Raj, uh, you are talking about a 